right um, because we're worth it. Um, I think that's a pretty good starting point because if you don't think you're worth it, you're not going to get it. Yeah? And I think that's just something to think about and think about as we go through this. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, I'm going to hopefully make the case for negotiation training in agencies. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do in WPP and what we do every year in WPP. It's not a one-off not a one-off thing. Um, the P word has occurred several times today. Wouldn't you like your children to grow up to say, I'd like to be a chief procurement officer? <laughs> yeah. My kids have never said that, actually, but there you go. Right, so we'll tell you a little bit about, about procurement. Um, one or two of the speakers already today have said something about gaming. And I'd like, again, to plant a few seeds in your mind about gaming, because there's an awful lot of stuff in negotiation is about playing games. There's an even bigger amount of stuff in procurement, which is about playing games. And we'll, we'll, we'll you know, take the covers off um, some of that today. Um, and then we'll sort of leave you again with some, some hopefully challenging things to think about. Right, negotiation training. Um, all of the things we've talked about today, whether it's Michael challenging business leaders to do things differently, whether it's Tim, talking about different pricing models, and I think Tim finished with the need to negotiate your way into it. All of this requires negotiation. And I have a hypothesis here, or a challenge here, which basically says negotiation training is not an L&D issue, a learning and development issue in agencies. It's not a training issue at all. It's a leadership issue. In the same way that you require leadership to change the paradigm, the pricing paradigm, or, or the way we do business with clients, the way agencies negotiate is established and set um, by leadership in agencies. Unless leadership gets it, no amount of training in the world is going to change your people and suddenly solve the problem. I remember reading a little statistic somewhere that said something like 90% of negotiation training is wasted. And it's wasted because we don't actually change the frame within, within which we, we drop people back into. So what do we do? Well, how, negotiate, sorry, how uh, agencies negotiate with an out, you know, following an outrageous demand could be by procurement, could be just simply by, uh, by your client. Well, it starts something like this. We kind of go, ah, how dare they? Yeah, they are insulting our professionalism. We are strategic partners of this client. Yeah, we, do, we, we actually do the outreach thing pretty well, don't we? In, in our industry, we have years of practice at it. And actually, once we get over the outrage phase, we actually think, you know, the client must have got it wrong. Yeah, they, they, they must be sort of misunderstanding something here. And if only we persuade the client of the error of their ways, it'll all be fine. But it rarely works. It rarely works. And actually what happens then is we kind of default back into the outrage bit again and we panic. And after we panic, we think, actually, there's got to be some sort of rational answer to this. So we drop into something that looks a little bit more like problem solving. Now, have you ever been in a situation where a client says, I want 20% off for the same thing that I got last year? Yeah, fairly common one that we all deal with. And you spend the next half an hour rolling out your spreadsheets, rolling out your killer arguments, um, trying to convince the client that actually there's something wrong here. And you say, you know what? If we accepted your 20% off, we would lose money on this deal. We'd end, we'd end up writing you guys a check. And the client says, that's your problem, not mine. Heard that one? Because problem solving only works if both parties actually see the problem uh, in the same way. So again, a rational way doesn't actually work desperately well. So we do a little bit of the outrage and panic together. Yep, again, we enjoy this stuff. It's good, it's therapeutic, isn't it? Right. Um, and then we try a little bit of haggling. Now, haggling is not negotiation. What we try here is we say, we'll throw them a bone, I think is the technical term, isn't it? They asked for 20%, we'll give them 10, and it'll be fine. But of course it's not, um, and they're still there and they're still coming. So we escalate, we go to the boss. We say, boss, we've got a problem. Um, and we say, it's these bloody procurement people again. They just don't understand. If, if only they understood 
our world. These guys were buying rubber bands last week. Yeah, and now they're buying creative agency. If only they understood, it would all be fine. And the boss then makes the sort of executive decision in negotiation that bosses do. I think that laughter is a bit rueful, isn't it? Um, and we give in. We give in while blaming procurement, but we also add a little subtlety to it. We say we gave in for the sake of the relationship. The technical term is bollocks. <laughs> it's an excuse. We can do better, guys. We can do better, but we have to train. Now, I, I put this slide up not, please, not to say we and WPP are doing a great job. I put this slide up to demonstrate the level of commitment that we make to negotiation training uh, in WPP. Um, and this is a snapshot of a year. We do this stuff every year um, and have done now for eight or nine years. Um, at, at the bottom of the pyramid here, we have kind of entry level. We've been experimenting with online negotiation training using an American company called CorpU. Um, we've kind of settled on a three week online course, um, 50, 60 people going through it at a time. Um, it has its place. We've had, we've had mixed um, reactions to it, mixed successes to it, but we think it has its place and we continue to experiment. Great way to get people through um, some form of negotiation training in a very cost-effective way. And by the way, if, I, if I'm teaching negotiation training in WPP, I've got a class of 20 people, and I often start the training with how many of you have done negotiation training before? 10%. 10%, 15%, absolute max. And the more senior I go in an agency organization, the less that percentage gets. And it was usually a very long time ago. Right, so um, last year, 250 plus people through some kind of online negotiation training. The volume stuff we do is the bit in the middle. We start getting into face-to-face -face training at that point. We've created over the years an internal, highly tailored, very much in our world, one day workshop, typically for up to 20 people. We've done train the trainers around the world. So, you know, it, it, it's a fairly, uh, a fairly large group of people now who train this stuff, 20 plus people doing it around the world. Um, over a thousand people every year going through that internal negotiation training. Okay, internally created, internally delivered, delivered at no cost other than teeny costs of people flying around the world to do it if required. At the top of the pyramid there, um, we work with one of the sponsors who are sponsoring the, uh, the course today. Good plug for you guys. Did I get that right? Yeah? yeah. Right, thank you. Scott Work at the back there. Right. Um, we've worked with Scott Work for five or six years now. Um, and we, 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 we call it intensive skills development. We actually take people off site, three days, video everything, replay everything, um, very intensive stuff. Um, expensive. Reassuringly expensive, <laughs> yes. He's, he's been telling me that for years, and I, I, I get the pleasure of negotiating the Scott Work contract, it's wonderful. Right, um, the, my, my, my point is this, you have to train to change behavior. Training needs to be done at multiple levels. You have to give people the ability to grow their skills, this critical skill, as they go through their career and we put a lot of effort into it. And again, if anyone would like to find out more about what we've done, why we've done it, et cetera, et cetera, um, grab me later. I do a lot of the, the, the writing and the teaching and whatever in this stuff. Right, um, as well as the things that I said we'd talk about, um, I, I, I come from the procurement school of always give them more than they think they're gonna get. Yes, I'm that sort of guy, right? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna drip feed two or three little skills tips, the sort of thing that we would be teaching our people in WPP. And this is the first one. This is the first one. Something procurement people call conditioning. Commonly heard in typical negotiations. And let's see how many of these you recognize. Are we recognizing this stuff? It's all bullshit. Conditioning is the ability in a negotiation or preparing for a negotiation to get the other side thinking about they're going to have to do something, it's just a matter of how much. Yeah? And all of these little statements uh, are what procurement people call conditioning. And procurement make a science out of this stuff. There are books or chapters of books written about how to condition your opponent um, in a negotiation scenario. Okay. 
my advice to you is, as it always is with our WPP folks we're working with, is be skeptical about what you're hearing. Be very, very skeptical. Um, one of the folks we've worked with over the years, many, many years, is Harvard. We've done a lot of work with the Harvard program and negotiation. Um, they publish a monthly you know, newsletter, whatever. And I, I read an article, it was a kind of academic article about conditioning and negotiation, effectively telling lies in negotiation. Um, and it came to the conclusion, maybe not surprisingly, that everyone tells lies in negotiations all the time. All the time, we all do, not just procurement, by the way. We all tell lies. Usually we, we rationalize it to ourselves, the quite small lies, little ones, um, but we all do. Now, Harvard being Harvard couldn't write an academic paper and call it telling lies in negotiation. It's a bit abrupt, it's a bit Scottish, isn't it, really? So they actually came up with a better term. They called it ethical drift. <laughs> I can just see the headline and campaign next week. Kinnaird says procurement ethically drifts in negotiation. Shock, horror, isn't it? Right, okay. So be skeptical um, in terms of what the other side are telling you and think about conditioning in reverse. Think about this thing of scarcity that Dan was talking. I can't give you a proposal, We're really busy this month. So much new business coming out of our ears, you know, whatever. It's conditioning. These are all conditioning messages. Right. Wouldn't you like to understand procurement? I can sense the enthusiasm. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Procurement, basically. If you go to procurement school, now there's a thought, but if you go to procurement school, you will be fundamental. I mean, remember that, that, that one that, uh, that, that Tim showed with the, the thing scrolling down, all the conferences, whatever else. If you strip out all the rubbish, procurement basically is about four things. It's about value, cost, cash, and risk. That is what procurement are trying to deliver within their organizations. It's what my team tries to deliver within WPP. Let's just take each of them in turn quickly. Cost is the easy one. That's where we reduce the price. If we reduce the price, the cost goes down um, and we can claim a saving for the organization. That is what procurement is best known for and it's what you hear most from them. But let's look at some of the others. Procurement are also tasked with maximizing value in a deal. So what can I get the agency to commit to which gives me free stuff? that gives me more stuff, that gives me better access to some kind of thinking, I will try and negotiate that into the deal as well. Cash, well, we heard about cash already this morning. 60-day payment terms, 90-day payment terms. Actually, you know what? I might pay you eventually if I like you. Yeah, cash. So cash is clearly uh, an important um, word in procurement's lexicon. And the final one is one that people rarely think about, um, which is risk. Now, there's two aspects of risk. One is I'd like to take all the contractual risk and pass it from me to you, which is why in contract negotiations, procurement will always be doing things like we want to push unlimited liability and we want to have all the intellectual property ownership. Very, very natural stuff for procurement to ask for. But here's the other aspect of risk. And it's what stops procurement buying on price and price alone. Because again, perceptually, I think that's what most people say. Here come these procurement guys. It's all now going to be down to price. Well, actually, it's risk that stops people, procurement people, buying on price and only price. Because if I'm the procurement guy and I recommend we should go with Agency X for a brand campaign that's going to save the company, and Agency X crashes and burns, and the brand campaign is horrible and it's a disaster, I get fired as the person who's actually driven the, you know, the, the, the choice. So procurement will assess risk in terms of outcome risk, output risk, financial risk, all of those kind of risks when it comes to actually helping the business make a decision. And we don't often think about that. I mean, to think about it a little bit more. So value, cost, cash, and risk. Four procurement secrets. I will get drummed out of the union for telling you this stuff. Right, four procurement secrets. It's not procurement's job to buy on price. It's procurement's job to, to get the best deal for the agency the client has already decided they want to work with. Client makes the decision, procurement, go get the best deal. Or 
we're running a competitive pitch process. How can I design the competitive pitch process to give me the best agency at the lowest agency price point? That then gets baked into the way I actually create the game. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit later when we talk about gaming. We're in the final stages of a pitch. We're down to a short list of two or three in procurement. Say, guys, you need to sharpen your pencil. Yeah, you are the most expensive agency. Well, I'm actually telling the other two the same thing, by the way, but um, you are the most expensive agency. Um, this decision is now all down to price. Bollocks again, right? It just isn't. But I'm not going to tell you that. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, this again. Think about gaming. I am going to tell you things that are in my best interest to tell you. So again, it's all about price. The only part of marketing services spend where procurement will be or may be the decision maker is where something is very commoditized, or something has become very commoditized. Things like print or or whatever, which in marketing terms these days no one really worries that much about, although I'm sure the printers do. Um, Procurement may well be the decision maker. In certain clients, their voice will be louder. In other clients, their voice will be softer. They're almost certainly going to be part of it, but they're certainly not the decision maker. I'm never going to get less than I ask for, so I'm just going to keep asking until you say that magic word. Yep, unless you tell me no, and I hear no, and I hear it unequivocally no, as in, watch my lips, Tom, which part of no don't you get, yeah? I am going to keep asking. And if you keep giving, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm just going to keep asking. So as long as the concessions keep coming, I will keep asking, yeah? So again, that word no is an important word in your vocabulary. And we'll come back to that a little bit in a second as well. And there are many ways for procurement to claim a saving, um, not just off your fees. In fact, there are far more ways for procurement to claim a saving than you would ever believe to be possible. Um, and that savings word is an important word as well, because how do you think procurement gets measured? Well, you know, when I, when I watched the lady from Coca-Cola earlier on in the video, I suspect your thoughts were a bit like my thoughts, which is, yeah, we've heard all that stuff before. They talk value, they talk innovation, they talk whatever, ROI, but the reality is the only thing they ever care about is cost. And the reason is because that's how they get measured. It's very hard to measure innovation. It's very hard to measure risk, but it's bloody easy to measure a cost saving. When, when I'm strolling around the corridors of power at WPP, as I'm doing at the moment, and I see Martin Sorrell, what do you think he asks me? Yeah, well, the first question is, who are you? <laughs> the WP people have heard all my jokes before. This is a wonderful audience. I can, <laughs> yeah? Rick, isn't this fabulous? Right, excellent, right. Um, actually, his, his I, I guess not. Right, the second question, of course, is how much have you saved me this quarter? or this six months or, or this year. And of course, it's never enough, yeah? Um, because the only good way of measuring procurement is savings. So you get all this sort of lovely language about value and partnership and I'm for procurement and I'm here to help you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These people are getting measured on savings, but there are many, many different ways to claim a saving. We have four different ones in WPP, two that we call cash, two that we call non-cash, but they all add up to a savings number. Here's an interesting question for you to add, ask your procurement team or your procurement person in your client over a beer with you buying. Tell me, how, how, how do you actually get measured? What, what, sort of, what sort of the metrics go into your savings number? I think we stopped counting at something like 25. Yeah, there are lots and lots and lots of ways procurement can claim savings, cost avoidance, process improvement, value add, break it down, you know, whatever it is, efficiency. If you can help them monetize something that they can take back and claim, you know, aren't, aren't we heroes in this organization, you will take the pressure off your fees. If you try and have a haggle on your fees, you'll lose because their stick is bigger than your stick, fundamentally. Yeah? So we've got to shift the language again, picking up in Tim's thing. You know, change the language, change the behavior, okay? So help them win by helping them monetize the work that you do on an ongoing basis. 
All right, um, on to my second skills tip, GTWTWYT. It looks like a Welsh railway station, doesn't it? It's the world's longest acronym. It actually comes from Scottwork. Uh, this is one of our Scottwork tips that we use in the Scottwork course. This is the second analogy from martial arts today, isn't it? Yeah. I think that's how it feels somehow, somehow, doesn't it? It's like these very large procurement organisations and agencies trying its best. Um, and the analogy that Scott Work uses is what they call sumo and judo. Um, and it's, a, it's very similar to what Tim was saying, which is, which is about levelling the playing fields. But I think the analogy goes a little bit further here because it's also about agility. It's, it's about recognising that because their stick is likely to be bigger than our stick, and when they start hitting us with it, it's going to hurt, we have to be a little bit more agile. We have to be a little bit more creative, dare I say, which is what we do. Yeah, so why don't we try and apply some of this creativity shit to the negotiation stuff that we do by things like giving them what they want in terms of work for us. So for example, the client comes in and makes a completely unreasonable demand. Rather than just getting pissed off, rather than just saying no, or even worth just saying yes and giving in, how is about actually going back with a proposal instead? Yes, I can give you 20% off for the same thing that you got last year, but not with the same team and not with the same output. So we're building linkages between what the client actually wants and the proposal that we're making. Even better, building on our pricing analogy from earlier on, give them some options. So option one, here's one that gives you 20% off. Option two, here's one that gives you 15. Option three, here's one that increases your cost by 10%. But my God, it's a, a disruptive, challenging proposal. And what will it do to your brand ROI? Talk about changing thinking and actually changing mindset. <laughs> way, way more powerful than actually just having an argument. And I think Scott work would teach um, a proposal beats an argument every time. So again, that's a mindset shift. So give them what, you, uh, what they want. Uh, on your terms. Right, so it's about gaming, but the game has changed. And because the game has changed, we have to develop and understand um, a new set of game rules. And let's just think about that for a second. Here's another academic reference. It's from a book called 3D Negotiation by a couple of Harvard academics called Lax and Sabanius. It's, it's, it's a little bit heavy stuff, um, but, but I'm always looking for just little nuggets, little insights I can drop into our internal training. And I quite like the framework that they put together. And it goes something like this. It basically says that a lot of negotiation training, a lot of traditional negotiation training focuses on tactics. It focuses on who's going to say what. It focuses on who's going to be good cop and who's going to be bad cop. And quite often in the agency world, um, it'll be something like, um, let's jump in the cab. We'll have a quick coffee in Starbucks and have a chat about the negotiation. You be good cop. I be bad cop. We've got our killer arguments lined up in our pockets. It'll be fine. Yeah? Does that sound familiar? Vaguely. Trouble is, of course, leveling the playing field between buyers and sellers, they're, they're a heck of a lot better prepared than we are, and we get stuffed yep, when, when we go in. So we have to be able to do better than that. How do we do better than that? Well, they say think about it at three levels. It's not that tactics are unimportant, it's just that they're somewhat overrated. Tactics on their own are not going to help you in the day. Let's think about where we can create some value. This starts to come back into, again, the principles that Michael and, and Tim were talking about, particularly around how can we create some options? How, we can act, how can, can we actually challenge the way the client was thinking? Blair stuff and, and, and you know, uh, uh, winning without, uh, without pitching. Could we put a lot more thought into deal design? And I think the answer is probably yes. Again, that's where we can bring the whole creative thing to bear. Where it can all go horribly wrong, even if we've done the, de the deal design bit, is what these guys call setup. And setup, they, they, they have a whole list of things that go into setup, but let me give you some examples of things that from a negotiation perspective would go into setup. Setting up properly in negotiation is having your senior leadership team involved in the preparation. Setting up properly means your senior leadership team have signed off on the multiple pricing models and the multiple options that you're going to bring to the table. Set up means that your senior leadership team have empowered the agency negotiators around what they can negotiate and what they're not allowed to negotiate. And the negotiators know at certain points for each of the key issues, they will have to call back to the base, escalate to get an answer because they're not empowered to go any further. 
Set up means that it's not the account lead, it's not the client lead who's going in to negotiate with the client and the procurement team. In fact, in many ways, in my view, the client leader is the worst person in the world to negotiate with the client because they have too many competing, you know, competing priorities um, around their own well-being and their own careers and, and whatever else as well. You have to build a team. So who's going to be on the team? Are the team prepared? Do the team know the roles they're actually going to play in that? Are they clear on the key issues the agency wants to bring to the table? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not a 10-minute conversation in Starbucks, which is why it often doesn't get done, because we're busy and lots of other things you know, come into play. But here's the challenge. Would we spend 10 minutes in Starbucks preparing for the big creative presentation? No, we wouldn't. So why do we try and do it when it comes to the big commercial negotiation? Something to think about. Right, um, here is a relatively simple graph which took about six of WPP's keenest commercial brains <laughs> hours to work out, Nick, didn't it? Yes, it did. It absolutely did. The amount of debate that went into this. And, it, and it's building on some of the stuff that, again, Blair was talking about in terms of games, and particularly pitching games. The reason we've built this in is because after about seven or eight years of negotiation training, um, increasingly we heard the words, all this negotiation stuff is fine when we're face-to-face -face with the client, but when we're pitching, it all goes to pot. And we thought, well, what's going wrong here? And we started thinking about this from a gaming point of view, and we started thinking about it from a power dynamics point of view. So along the bottom axis, we have something called time, from the point the request for a proposal hits the agency desk to the point where the work gets awarded and, and the work starts. On the vertical axis, we have a, um, uh, a, a, an arbitrary thing called agency power. I'm gonna pinch one of Michael's ideas Michael, what was it, SMUs, Michael? Yeah. I'm going to come up with the Canard Work Power Mechanism or something, you know, um, a, a, an acronym for power. Yeah, when you think about that one. So, so just think about it relatively. Is it high or is it low? Our proposal is that when an agency, sorry, when an RFP hits the table to 10 different agencies, it's going out to a long list. Um, agency power is actually pretty high at that point. And that might seem strange, but think about it this way. A, a procurement's game, a pitch game, only works if the right agency players are part of that pitch. There will be, a, there, you know, let's say 10 agencies, there'll be five agencies that marketing says have to be in there. There might be another five agencies that procurement would like to be in there because they want to bring some challengers, they want to bring some new thinking, whatever else as well. If you are one of those five that marketing say they have to be there, you have the power to negotiate your way into a pitch. So if you don't like the pitch rules, if you don't like the timescales, if you don't like the fact that it says, agree to my standard terms and conditions within which is 180 day payment terms and all the rest of it, you have the right to say no. But why don't we? Well, we don't often because we're fearful of getting kicked out of the pitch. But think about it this way. If the client's prepared to kick you out of the pitch right at the beginning, the chances of you winning are a lot worse than one over two N, which is what Blair said. Yeah, it's like nil. Yeah, so it's a great test of whether a client is serious about having you in the game at all. Always ask yourself the question, if I do this, who is left with the problem? And if I choose not to play by the client's rules, I love Blair stuff. If I choose not to play by the client's rules, the client is left with the problem unless they really don't care about us being there in the first place. And we've just saved ourselves three months and how many hundreds of thousands of pounds in, in pitch fees. So be bullish and negotiate at that point because you have the power of entry into the game. The bad news, of course, is once the game starts, our power definitely declines. We feel the pressure. We've put all the work into it. We've committed all the money to it. The pressure's ramping up. We're feeling the pressure, no question. We just have to ride with that, uh, in my view. But let's imagine the client gets to the point of shortlisting five agencies now. It's not the final shortlist, but it's, a, it's, it's an intermediary shortlist. Our view is your power, the, 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 the inflection of the curve starts to change. Now you can argue, does it just flatten? Does it go down slightly less steeply? Does it go up? We would suggest it goes up a little bit, but the client is expressing some choice. And because the client's expressing some choice, the power certainly changes in your favor. When the client goes to the final shortlist, two agencies, three agencies, it doesn't matter what it is, our view of power is this. 
Now think about this. You're in the last five minutes of the game. The game's been going on for three months, six months. You've invested huge amounts of time, effort, energy. Your boss is getting excited. Martin Sorrow's getting excited if you're WPP. And they're saying, are we going to win this? And you feel the pressure, don't you? But actually, your power is going up. Think about what I said earlier. Procurement's job is to get the best deal for the marketing agency, the, the advertising agency that uh, the client wants to work with. 25 years plus in procurement, we run this stuff all the time. 95% of the time and above, the internal client for procurement will already have made the choice. The last five minutes of a game is pure theater designed to maximize the leverage. You are the most expensive agency again. You need to sharpen your pencil. You've got until five o'clock to come back with a better price or you're out. All this stuff said with a poker face because that's what procurement do. But if you said, sorry, I'm not gonna do that. If you said, there's my proposal. If you said, here's what I'm prepared to do for you, but in return, I want to get this back and, and all the rest of it, you will be surprised on the outcome. I would go so far to say, as you will never win a pitch by throwing money at it, nor will you lose a pitch by throwing money at it in the last five minutes of the deal. The game is already won. So when agency chief execs come in and say, take another 5% off, give them another, give them a free onboarding, whatever. You're, you're just throwing money at something where a decision has already been made. So we're, tr we're thinking about changing an entire culture of the way that our people think um, about new business winning. When the client awards the work, provided that the key contract terms are pre-agreed, now it's up to you to define what you mean by key contract terms, but provided the key commercials are agreed, not necessarily the contract. We all know contracts take a long time these days to negotiate, but providing the important things are done. Your power continues because from a procurement point of view, that's your worst nightmare. Once the supplier has been awarded the work, the, the leverage I have over that supplier is nil. Yeah, so basically once you know you've won, I'm stuffed basically, which is why the game is designed to drive all of this stuff out uh, in advance. So your power maintains provided you've actually done the key contract terms. The converse of course is, if you basically get the call on the Friday to say you've won the work and the client says, and can you just get a team in on Monday because we're really keen to start and you guys go, yeah, you know, and in you go and then three months later, um, you know, you've racked up the hours, you're not getting paid, nothing's been agreed. And of course the power thing goes completely the other way. Anyway, things to think about when it comes to pitching. Into the final skills tip, I did mention earlier on the important word, no. It's the hardest word in an agency vocabulary. Um, we grow up in an environment in agencies where the answer is yes, what's the question? And of course, when we have to say no to clients, we often do it badly or we don't do it at all. And then we get pissed off because we work all weekend because we've agreed to something we didn't actually want to do. Does that sound vaguely familiar as well? So again, we teach our people how to say no well. This again comes from Harvard, another academic called Bill Yuri, who wrote a book called The Power of a Positive No. And what essentially he's doing is saying, you actually start saying no by saying yes. Isn't that weird? But the yes is a respectful yes, as in I don't hear the client's request and go nuts and get outraged. I hear the quiet client's request, I ask some respectful questions, I, I, I replay the thing back, I'm basically saying I understand what you're asking for and why you're asking for it, respectful. I then follow it with my no, um, and here's, although I understand it, here's why I can't agree to it, and here are my reasons for not agreeing to it, and then I finish with a yes, because I know it's quite a hard thing to deliver and the client's gonna hate you at that point. The yes is, and here's what I am prepared to do. Yes, I hear you. No, I'm not prepared to do it for the following reasons, but here's what I am prepared to do. You'll be amazed at how that changes the dynamic um, of the conversation. This is what McKinsey teach their consultants, by the way. We had McKinsey in last year talking to us, and this is one of the things they talked about. They teach the consultants the yes, no, yes thing, um, excuse me, with, uh, with clients. All right, final thoughts from me, um, four of them. It's what I started with, negotiation is a leadership issue. It's not an agency L&D issue. If you don't get leadership involved, you're wasting your time. 
And we've learned that the hard way, by the way, and we're still learning it. It's not an easy thing to do, but it's much easier to say. This is me being a little bit Scottishly challenging again. We've done a great job, and I've been in this industry now 15 years. We've done a great job in that 15 years of developing a victim culture. It's all procurement's fault. If only procurement would stop doing whatever, then it would all be fine. No, it's not. Yeah, it's, Michael said in his opening thing, it's about the way agencies interact with procurement. It's about learning how to say no, when to say no, and how to drive things forward. It is, it, it'll never change if we expect the procurement to change first. It just isn't gonna happen. Which leads me on to, the more you do what procurement asks you to do, the worse it's gonna get. Why would they do anything different? You know, if my procurement game is working, and every time I run a pitch, I get a lower price, why would I not run a pitch next time? Yeah, I'll, I'll do whatever is successful to do. So the reality is, um, folks, you know, if you behave like a rubber band supplier, you will be treated like a rubber band supplier and expecting procurement to do something different um, is, is not gonna happen. And just back to the training thing again, um, I think it's non-optional. It's a little bit like Brexit yeah, and, and all this negotiation stuff that our esteemed civil servants apparently are going to do on our behalf, which I find quite scary. Um, but the, you know, despite me saying that a lot of negotiation training can be wasted, I think there is no option. At every level in your organisation, from CEO and board down to juniors, um, they have to look and learn in terms of how to negotiate as their careers develop. And it's not a one-off hit. It's not we do a course this year and tick in the box, which is what L&D people do. We've been doing this now in WPP eight, nine years, 10 years almost, and it's getting more every year than less. We're building and pricing now into training workshops. You know, the procurement team co-train with our client, uh, commercial team now, pricing, commerciality, negotiation, whatever. It's a journey. Um, and I guess I would finish by commending for those of you who haven't taken the first step to do it. If I can help at all, you know, over lunch or whatever, please let me know. And that is it.